Top 15 card games of spring 2024 is we're going to take a look at today. Welcome back, everyone. I saw you enjoyed us taking a look at the state of Japanese TCGs throughout this previous year. And so the same source as last time around, Ikech Tensho has provided us with the summary of the TCG industry's data report for the beginning of fiscal year 2024. So in Japan, the fiscal year begins in April. And so you have April, May, and June as Q1. And so he basically went and summarized the numbers for this first fiscal year and there's actually quite a few interesting general conclusions so i think what we're gonna do real quick is first look at what he writes in this document and then look at what released for each of these games to make them rank in and you'll also notice if you watch the previous video which of the games fell out of the top 15 with a lot of new card games coming out this year so he basically wrote that when comparing the quarter one of 2023 and 2024 there is a 110 percent increase in um sales or just in you know profits so of course you see 681 so this kanji means oku which stands for 100 million so 681 100 million <laughs> is um a lot for last year but this year it sees an increase to 753 so basically it's about a 10 percent increase which is good but you, he says that in comparing just the month of june there was a decrease of about you know 89 percent from last year's june so maybe it's just because there's not as many good products releasing in june compared to the other months but it is overall a increase here so he says that in terms of what counts towards the numbers here it's of course the sales of um you know sealed product so of course boxes packs decks all that kind of stuff then also single cards and what is called oripa so oripa are called that is the shortened name for original packs so it's packs that the stores create from their leftover stock that basically you know you can have oripa of different prices right you can have oripa for 500 yen you can have oripa for 5000 yen and then the content of them will go up based on the price usually as well and then you also have the sales of single cards within the particular high price. So we're talking about like One Piece prize cards. We're talking about like Black Lotus. We're talking about like PSA 10 Pokemon stuff, things along those lines. And then he also looks at the sales from resellers too. So Tenbaiya is uh, the, the, the cursed word in Japanese. But basically he talks about how for some, for the resellers, the people that the scalpers basically, you know, if the, if a game isn't scalpable to the to scalpers it's over right so they say like oh Yu-Gi-Oh, it's over there's no point to scalp it so the game is dead but actually the sales of singles and sealed product of Yu-Gi-Oh is so good it still ranks very highly he basically breaks down the different games that he wants to point out their uh positioning so he points out the points on pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh, duel masters one piece Dragon Ball, the new Dragon Ball TCG, which by the way, the old Dragon Ball TCG never existed in Japan. Dragon Ball Fusion World is both in English and in Japan, but the previous one was English only, or I guess international only, it just didn't exist in Japan. Then he also talks about Dream Order, which is the baseball TCG that some of you watching might not even know existed, but actually it sold really, really well because it doesn't target card gamers. And the Conan TCG is the other new one. So the three new ones, that came out in this fiscal uh, quarter were Dragon Ball, Dream Order, and Conan, and also was the Japanese release of Flesh and Blood. So surprisingly, Flesh and Blood does not rank in, so he also doesn't give any comments on it. So let's take a look at the top 15, and I think we're just going to go from the top, uh, from the number one spot down to the 15. So number one, without any surprise, is the Pokemon TCG. Basically at pretty similar numbers to last year. So 308 hundred million last year, 330 hundred million this year, which is quite surprising because this year there's been a much better production of product so you're able to get boxes really easily for pokemon now compared to like spring last year it was really hard to get like the chien pao set that came out so their increase is a little bit for pokemon like 106 percent and if we take a look at what came out in this uh beginning of fiscal year we had the ogre pond set which i personally did buy even i bought like quite a few boxes of this one because i was hunting for a lot of like the ogre pond stuff like dragapult and stuff like that they also released these battle master decks for chien pao and charizard dx which were like amazing beginnings for competitive players right 
This is arguably the best deck in format for quite a long time now in Pokemon, and they just sold it to you for 3,000 yen. So you buy this and you have a great competitive entry product into Pokemon. So they also had, of course, a bunch of like other merch, you know, like sleeves and whatnot. They, this does count, by the way. And then they had, of course, um, it's called Night Wanderer or Shrouded Fable, I believe it's called in English, that just came out in English. This was out in June. So this was also a, I'm not sure how well this sold, this set sold, but there is a lot of chase cards um, for competitive players like Fezzendipity in this that I think definitely ranked in pretty highly. But Pokemon can just release anything and it's generally speaking gonna sell well. So you see a lot of merch, especially like sleeves and whatnot, definitely do sell well. And then so basically the sleeves and whatnot basically cut off around here. And then July onwards is the beginning of quarter two. So that doesn't count. So basically it was just two sets, right? And two new decks. And that alone is enough to generate all this. But keep in mind that this also includes like single sales and all that kind of stuff too. So about Pokemon, he says that, you know, it is not just the number one TCG, but it's also the fact that it's so much more product is now available that a lot of people are actually picking it up. You know, Pokemon, he says, has been like growing really, really quickly over these last few years, but the growth itself has slowed down, but the numbers are still crazy. So it's still the number one card game and it's still been increasing in its sales a little bit. So it's already like a very like fantastic position to be in. And Pokemon always releases something amazing at the end of the year, like V-Star Universe. So there's definitely something more to look forward to in this year. And of course, you know, there's not just the sales of product that I showed you, but also like the Oripa I mentioned. Pokemon is the by far the biggest like player in the Oripa business in terms of the shops that make their own packs and get people to buy them, you know, for the high rarity trainer cards, etc. And of course the high, you know, expensive trainer cards in general. And for, he says that for shops, you know, the Oripa sales aren't as much or as high as they were before, but they're at a sufficient level where they're still going pretty consistently as well. So for Pokemon is basically a very, very solid point. For my personal um, kind of pointing that I want to talk about is if you look at it, 2024 is 753 hundred million, right? Pokemon takes up 330 of those hundred million. So that basically means that the number one accounts for almost, we're getting like pretty close to half of the entire TCG industry. Like you'd have to, even if you put all of this, you know, if you put all of the, the lower rankers together, they can barely touch the Pokemon numbers, right? So it really goes to show how important and responsible Pokemon is for how big the TCG industry is, right? If it wasn't for Pokemon being at the forefront, probably the rest of us wouldn't be as high in these numbers too, because it's oftentimes thanks to the fact that people might start with Pokemon or have their first trading card game experience be with Pokemon, whether it's just opening packs or whether it's also playing, that they then touch other card games too, that they then try out other card games. Maybe they see, you know, they go to a card shop to play Pokemon. They see people having fun with Yu-Gi-Oh or One Piece or Vanguard or Evolve, and then they go try that out too, right? So I think Pokemon's position and existence is really important in driving up the entire industry as a whole. And in my Discord, there was a really interesting point being raised is that with all the new card games that come out, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people they only care about Pokemon. They don't actually care about trading card games that much. They just care about Pokemon on cards, if that makes sense, right? So whenever these companies are releasing new card games, you have to kind of think that you're not targeting this number, you're targeting to be among these numbers, right? You're probably targeting these card game players, unless you're something like Dream Order that doesn't really target any of this, right? So you could say like when you're releasing a new card game, the income you're expecting to make is never going to be what Pokemon is making, but it's something more along of these lines. And the, the people that are that mostly make up this amount aren't really people that are going to are going to dabble in other card games to begin with. So that's an interesting little thought um, that was brought up in my discord that, you know, I feel like I wanted to share with you guys too. collecting but not playing is also counted here. Yes. I mean, collecting means you're spending money. As long as you're spending money, you're you're part of these numbers, basically. I am, you know, as a player, I'm also part of these numbers. Looking at number two, though, we have the Yu-Gi-Oh! OCG by Konami. So actually, about a third of um, Pokemon's numbers, and actually a pretty big increase from last year. So 9,300 million last year, 119,000 million 
um, this year, so 127% increase. So basically, um, for Yu-Gi-Oh, Ikechi says that, you know, it's been uh, very good growth, and I should actually show you the product. So Yu-Gi-Oh actually killed it in terms of um, the products released in this fiscal quarter. They released Infinite Forbidden, so Infinite Forbidden was a set that included uh, Demon Smith. So as for what I know is that this is a like tier zero deck or engine or something along those lines. And also Gimmick Puppets got a really good engine too. Yeah, Fiendsmith. Fiendsmith is, is something that is definitely to be afraid of is what I've heard. And there's also a bunch of like support for older decks, but also like these 25 anniversary um, quarter century secret rares are also like a big chase card too. So you've got like the Exodia, here as well so these are also part of that chase so i've heard that this set in general is um a very very hot item but that's not all in japan there was the duelist pack which was the tachyon one so for the the zale kids like uh i mean i, I love zale too but you've got yourself there's like you know kaiba stuff in here oh my goat blue angel i am i am the trickstar main that was at your locals casting reincarnation droll and lockbird of course so this set i think i'm not sure how well this set sold but i mean obviously well enough minus 200 response and then we had in my opinion by far the biggest point um we can take a look at animation chronicle 2 before i get onto this point animation chronicle was basically support for a bunch of the you know as as the name suggests anime decks and so you had a bunch of that going on but more importantly than anything else is the tactical tri decks these are some of the best entry product Yu-Gi-Oh has ever released so they released one for cyber dragons they released one for Evil Twin and one for Eldritch. So let's take a look at the Evil Twin one because I'm sure most of you are probably like, whoa, Yu-Gi-Oh has this kind of art now. When you look at this, if you're not a Yu-Gi-Oh player, if you've never played Yu-Gi-Oh, this probably doesn't really tell you much. But this starter deck is 1,100 yen retail, if I'm not mistaken. I think if I scroll down, it's going to tell me. Yeah, 1,100 yen. So like what, converted like $8 or something like that. And it includes basically... I'll, I'll point at the staples, the staples that are played in every single deck. These two, these two, arguably this, 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 and this, and this. All of these, I mean, hell, this, 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 this is all for $8. You buy two of these, you can go to a tournament. Like, it's insane. This is one of the best entry products to a game I've ever seen, and this in my opinion, was a very big contributor in growing the game too. These, when they released, were sold out immediately, and only recently I've seen them be restocked in a lot of card shops too. We can also take a look at the Cyber Dragon one for comparison's sake. So, I mean, if you want to just build Cyber Dragon as an engine, basically, I mean, you can also pick up this too. But dude, just look at this. They got so many. Oh my god, look at the Lightning Storm as well red reboot in here like even side deck cards are reprinted in this it's crazy this is so high quality i can i completely forgot what what the the card list for this was and then finally the eldritch one i'm curious what the eldritch one actually had so okay oh it's got the pots this is this has the pots the burials it's still got the two ashes as well it's got i mean they all have the imperms too the solemns okay but you know this makes sense, like rivalry of warlords, etc. It's like, you look at this though, and I'm just amazed, like Yu-Gi-Oh! Like this, this is huge. And the most important thing is that a lot of the marketing for these decks was done through the advertisement towards Master Duel players. So it was like, hey, Master Duel player, you love these decks, right? Check it out, 1,100 yen? You can also get into real Yu-Gi-Oh now. I mean, you know, like physical Yu-Gi-Oh, as in real, as in something you can touch. And I think that was a very, very smart marketing method, and it clearly succeeded. So looking at what Ikechi said about it, he basically said that the pre-constructed decks, so the new starter decks essentially, um, were full of these super important staple cards that encouraged many players who played Master Duel, but never played real, you know, paper Yu-Gi-Oh to start it out. And so even the people that haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh for a long time would basically go, oh, I mean, I mean, hey, look at all these staples. I might as well get back into Yu-Gi-Oh, right? I mean, it's so cheap to get into. And I saw my friends from, you know, the Vanguard community also be like, Yu-Gi-Oh is this cheap now? I might as well, right? So it's a very, very important thing. So he also talks about how a long time ago in a starter deck they included mirror force and when that starter deck came out many people got into it because they were like i can finally 
build a proper deck, right? It's it's really important. So he's, he kind of says like normally, you know, card games don't give out what players need because they kind of like understand the um, the needs of what a player needs to like get started into a game. They give all of these staples in these starter decks and, you know, the players also feel thankful to it too. So he says that this approach of putting all these like staples and stuff into a starter deck and making the game as easy to get into with this one product as possible has been very effective. So other card game companies, if, if Konami is doing it, you better start doing it too. This is honestly one of the most banger products that I've seen released, not just this year, but just in general. All right, up next is everyone's usual big surprise, Duel Masters. Oh, Duel Masters still exists. I can't believe it. Yes, it is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest card games in Japan. It is the biggest YouTuber card game in Japan. The biggest YouTubers for TCGs in Japan are all Duel Masters. They got like 300k subs. It's quite crazy because you have to consider that the Yu-Gi-Oh! YouTubers and the Pokemon YouTubers, they have a potential international audience to apply to as well because their games are available internationally. Duel Masters is exclusively only in Japan and they are the biggest YouTubers in the industry just because the game is this big and the game is watched this much and i would say that duel masters as a game is very entertaining to watch and it's very much made for youtube and that's probably a very big part of it too and i think you know the people making the videos like i watch the duel masters content creators myself as well you know i, I live in japan i'm like part of the same kind of like card game or ecosystem here um so i do think they're also very entertaining people in general duel masters 83 Oku compared to last year's 72, so 115% increase. So everything has this little, you know, like good little bit of increase. In terms of releases, um, they basically had the beginning of a new series uh, last year, I want to say. So Demon of Hypermoon released, and this was a very, like I remember this set being very hyped up. Like a lot of people were opening it like crazy because of this card. Um, this card was like very, very sought after. This like hyper mode mechanic, I believe is brand new. And so that definitely was a big part of it as well. So hyper mode was, was a very big part of it as much as I know. And then in June, we had the DM24 RP2, which is Kaiser of Hyper Dragon. So this actually, um, this set almost got me into Duel Masters as well because of this card. I think it looks super, super sick. I guess it's fine. So this one, this, um, this, this big dragon, the Bullshack Hyper Dragon just looks so sick to me. Um, I, I basically almost got into the game because of it. So I think this set was also pretty hype. And most importantly, in my opinion, was the release of the Ikinari Tsuyoi decks. So these were 500 yen starter decks that actually gave you a competitively ready deck for five bucks, which is crazy. So there was like, I remember watching vlogs of Duel Masters YouTubers going to tournaments with just these with zero changes and actually doing fairly well so that's also crazy to hear about and there's also the um basically they took a lot of the famous dragons like straight up the dragons from duel masters and turned them into waifus and then turned that into an anime and then turned that into a starter deck product and basically infinite profit like basically infinite money glitch um it's it's it even comes with a deck case. <laughs> it's just crazy. This this marketing really really worked, and turning uh, your turning your signature dragons into waifus works. So I'm looking forward to Blue Eyes White Dragon becoming a waifu in the next year. All right. So Ikechi also comments on Duel Masters this time as well. He says that um, like the the peak of Duel Masters was before the pandemic when the CSs, the championships for Duel Masters, were booming and the competitive TCG scene was really at its peak. Um, and now the, the like that the enthusiasm for those tournaments and like the hype has really been coming back. But as long as the game is fun to play, that should continue. And he said that the one of the big factors of Duel Masters in the past was that it was a game that um, a lot of elementary school students used to play and get into every year. But now that market is claimed by Pokemon and One Piece. So. He's also looking at how are they going to respond to that in the future. So yeah, he basically says like the, the final point about Duel Masters is like Duel Masters fans that want to play a game that feels like a game. You know, it's kind of, I guess I'm not sure what he really means by that. You know, is he implying, you know, about the more methodological Pokemon not feeling like a game or Yu-Gi-Oh where your game is decided by comparing your opening hands with your opponent doesn't feel like a game or what. But I do 
I think when I tried out Duel Masters, it did it does feel so extreme. Like the game ends in like 10 minutes or less, but there's just so much happening. Kusoge in like the good meaning of the word where everything is just blowing up, there's lasers everywhere, there's, there's like 5 million effects going on at the same time, and there's like no interaction either, so you're just watching your opponent combo off. But you have the comeback mechanic of the shield that can randomly turn the game around. So, Duel Masters is like super soge, but it's like very much in the good way, and I think a lot of the Duel Masters fans really like that. So that was Duel Masters, and then fourth, also unchanging, is One Piece card game, and also very interesting. So the numbers are about the same as when you have 500 and like a 5% increase, basically. But what's very important is that One Piece didn't release much in this first quarter either, right? So you basically have a starter deck that released in April. You've got like a bunch of like sleeves, the sound loader, play mats, like premium card, like alt art collections and One Piece set 8 that released in this quarter as well. So basically just two products. If you look at the next quarter, starting from July, was these amazing starter decks that definitely sold insane. One Piece card the best, which also sold like insanity, and there's still more coming up. I mean, there's, there's you know, set 9 coming up in just a few weeks as well here in Japan. But based on the fact that only two base, like two products came out, it's still fourth is very, very impressive. So let's take a look at what Ikechi says about One Piece. So he says, it wouldn't be surprising if One Piece kept growing even more, but this is very interesting. Bandai, in order to control the price, is like um, in a smart way, controlling and limiting the number of cards that are being produced so the value of cards doesn't plummet. What's interesting is that with one the reprint set, they actually overproduced, I'd say, the reprint set, where you can still find stock of it even now. And apparently there's another reprint wave coming of the reprint set too. So like for a lot of shops, they're losing a lot of money from um, the cards that got reprinted. So he kind of says like, you know, if you, if the, there's less, of the cards being made, you know, the, the prices of the singles will be, you know, will also go up accordingly. And, you know, shops are happy because if single prices are high-ish, that means that they can make a good bit of money from the game. So he also says that if you wanted to open a card shop from scratch, if you wanted to like do Duel Masters or Yu-Gi-Oh, there's too much old cards, right? So it would be a lot of investment and a lot of work really to start selling those games from nothing. But Pokemon and One Piece are really good to just like, if you're a new shop, to just get into because One Piece is still pretty young. And of course, Pokemon has rotation. So you just pick up whatever is new and then, you know, you just stock the cards that are in the current rotation and that's it. And so he says that we're most likely going to be going to be seeing uh, more shops that only handle One Piece in the future just because of this too. So pretty interesting stuff. All right, moving on from One Piece, we have Vice. So we do see a pretty big dip. We, we go from 59 to 31 Oku and Vice actually it wasn't that different from one piece last uh spring quarter so it was 4900 million but pretty big decrease right from 49 to 31 64 percent so it's actually quite a quite a big dip so for vice the releases in this uh fiscal quarter we saw the release of furiden which you would imagine would sell quite well then you have the idol master shiny girls shine more lots of shining here uh you've got the persona 3 reload booster um, look beautiful, by the way. I saw the cards in card shops all the time. I was like, damn, this looks real good. This, I don't think, sold well. Disney Mirror Warriors. I always see this in, like, the bargain bin. Every time, even today, I went to a shop and this was just stuck in the bargain bin. Like, these things are always, like, not doing great. It's it's kind of unfortunate. And then we had... This was uh, Grisaya Phantom Trigger. Do, do the kids these days even know what Grisaya is? Like... <laughs> It was also released in June, and then to um, top off the final bit of the um, fiscal quarter, we had the Idolmaster Cinderella Girls, cute, cool, and passion. So these are the same starter decks that Shadowverse Evolved did in Japan last year, and also the um, booster set for them, which unfortunately I also saw this in the bargain bin today. And then you have the trial deck for Yuru Camp Season 3. So their booster set's not out yet, but the trial deck was. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of like super powerful titles. It just seems like a bunch of like random stuff like Grisaya and Idolmaster and like the, the Disney... What, what even is Disney Mirror Warriors. Like, I think Persona 3 and, and, and Frieden look like good releases, but I don't really know. Like, the 3D, 3D Disney stuff, 
Oh, it's a mobile game? No. But yeah, so Vice basically had a bit of a dip. Let's take a look at what... Um, oh, Ikechi doesn't say anything about it. So the next point from Ikechi is going to be on um, Dragon Ball. So I guess there wasn't as much to, to really comment on. All right, but next, in number six, we have one of the, the first of the new card games that came out, which is Dragon Ball Fusion World with 20 hundred million yen as well. So basically... You've got, you know, you're under Vice, under One Piece, basically just a third of One Piece's numbers, uh, which is kind of surprising considering that One Piece only had two products come out in this fiscal quarter. If we take a look at it, it was basically just the release of set two. So this was like the top coup format. And this was also the reprint of set one. So set one came out before this fiscal year, but they reprinted it and, you know, just restocked a lot of the boxes, which of course also contributed to that as well. But otherwise it was like, you know, card, case, playmat, nothing too crazy out here. And of course, you know, the general release of the card game was quite hype. But Ikechi's points about Dragon Ball are quite interesting, where he basically says, set one for Dragon Ball was insanely popular, and there was also the serial Goku tournaments that happened when the game came out, which some card shops criticized, where the serial Goku went for an insane amount of money if you won these tournaments, but a lot of shops were saying that like, hmm, isn't it too early to be making these like crazy competitive tournaments with just one set of card pool? Like, the community for the card game hasn't even established itself and you're already throwing around like these, you know, like prize card, you know, prizes. Like, shouldn't you let the game develop on its own first? But so you basically had, he says, this gambleteki, like the, this gambly, gamble, gamble feel as well as competitive feel of if you won these tournaments, you got a card worth of insane amount of money, right? So he said, after that, it calmed down and it feels like things immediately just start, start to like cool down as well. It feels like now the Dragon Ball card game just kind of like sells at a normal pace it's just kind of like it's just selling at a normal pace it's probably going to continue to be fine as well but he says was it not able to reach the post one piece position right so one piece you know after a couple of years of, of being out is still fourth for dragon ball how is it going to look in quarter two is i think the big question here how is it going to look after its first three months of release dragon ball is literally a side game for day two at bandai tournaments damn so it sounds like in the west bandai like dragon ball really isn't that popular i think it's also because the original dragon ball card game never existed in japan and that's a very big part of it because the original card game for dragon ball never existed in japan for a lot of people this is their first time playing a dragon ball tcg and so that's obviously like a novelty factor whereas in the west it's more like oh you rebooted our game kind of thing right so obviously that's not going to be as good of a sentiment so moving forward we have good friends the the old man you know the the the, the old guy that shows up and smokes a cigar in the in the in the like in front of the lawn is mr mtg by wizards of the coast making 1,500 million yen uh, compared to 16 last year in spring. So just a small little decrease. MTG's releases were actually quite limited in this first fiscal quarter. They released this Outlaws of Thunder Junction set and the Modern Horizons 3 set. Now, I don't really know too much about these, but I'm kind of surprised. Only two products. Looks like all of this released in quarter two, so I'm sure we will see some higher numbers for Magic in quarter two. And it looks like Ikechi also didn't comment on MTG here either. So, but still, I mean, despite only releasing a couple products, still in seventh, I think, is also nice. And then, the game that a lot of people are like, what even is this? Dream Order. Dream Order made 1300 million yen, and it is a brand new game that came out this spring, and it is the Baseball TCG. Now, one thing that you must know is that baseball is the biggest sport in Japan. It is by far the biggest sport. And of course, in America as well, you have all of like the, the baseball card collectors. What if they made cards with the players on them with serial numbers and also made it into a playable game that apparently is quite fun. I hear from people that play Dream Order that's actually like the rules are quite fun. It feels more like a board game. So we take a look in April, they released two sets. They had Pa League Booster Pack in this and the Set League Booster Pack. So they got these two sets that came out that are also, I always see these sold at convenience stores like Family Mart, 7-Eleven, Lawson, always has Dream Order packs. And then in June, they released volume two of both of these leagues as well. 
On top of that, they also have starter decks for every single of the Japanese baseball league teams. So they've got like the Softbang Hawks. Like even I know a few of these, like Marines. I know who else do I know? I know the Giants. I know the Bay Stars. I've heard of the Carps. The Hunching Tigers, especially. I have a friend that really loved Hunching Tigers. And then they got some other merch. So like they made sleeves and like the play mat. Like look, the field looks like a baseball field. You know, it's great. You got all of this stuff that like if you play card games and you don't even play Dream Order, but you love baseball, you might buy the sleeves of your favorite team just because you want to use, you know, or like the playmat of your favorite baseball team. And that contributes to this number as well. So it's very interesting, right? Deck boxes, all this stuff for your favorite baseball team. And I think um, Ikechi's comment about it might actually clarify a lot of the confusion some of you might have regarding this. So he says, it's a baseball TCG. So it definitely didn't have much interest from general TCG players, right? But surprisingly, it, you know, he's like, he's like, it might be rude to say unexpected, but it ranked in at eighth in the ranking. So it's selling quite well. So this is just literally a case of we are not the target audience. We are we are simply you know we're, we're we're card game players we like anime card games we like ip based card games the baseball card game was not made for us it was made for a completely new audience and it's doing well that's that's the most important thing right we're not the target and that's okay still though like eight is pretty impressive and then the the biggest come up i would say the biggest increase and the biggest surprise is ninth place Rush Duel. So Rush Duel here made just a bit less than Dream Order at 1200 million, but compared to last year, it's almost double, right? Last year was 6.5, now it's 12. And I think if you kept up with what released for Rush Duel in Japan, you know exactly the reason. The reason why, if you look at it, start of fiscal year, April 6th, over Rush Pack 2 included this Dark Magician Girl that if you pulled the high rarity version the over rush rare or i think there was like a was there a serial number or something like that there was like some crazy rarity um dark magician girl if you pulled it she was going for an insane price she went for an insane price and people wanted to gamble people gambled and bought so many boxes of this set it sold out everywhere very quickly and it just goes to show dmg she worked before, she still works now. I also feel like it's kind of nice to just look at um, Rush Duel art. Like, it looks a lot more like a Japanese TCG than regular Yu-Gi-Oh! does. I guess these days Yu-Gi-Oh! does look more like a Japanese TCG, but especially arts like this, you know, a lot of my friends go like, hey, isn't this card from Vanguard? You know, it's like, hey, this looks like a Vanguard card. And I'm like, you know what? It does. It does. So their fiscal quarter, they had the Overrush pack, which I think is the biggest uh, contributor, but they also had this, the bar Burst Red pack as well that came out in May and this one I guess also included some archetypes from the anime unfortunately I usually always watch the Yu-Gi-Oh anime but I didn't haven't been watching the Rush Tool anime so if you like the Rush Tool anime recommend it to me in the comments tell me why I should watch it or why I shouldn't I'd love to hear your thoughts but they've got a bunch like they've got some cool like cute archetypes and stuff and some cool dragons like the one on the pack art I'm assuming these are all like they all appear in the anime so honestly knowing that these appear in the anime kind of makes me want to uh, check it out hop on the Rush anime it's flame levels of good Ooh. Ooh, okay, now you're talking my language. But so Rush Duel really, really jumped up. So I think Dark Magician Girl is definitely to thank for that. We'll see where things end up in the next quarter too. And then we have our next new entrant, which is the Detective Conan TCG by Takara Tomi. So Detective Conan, um, a lot of you probably don't know this, but in Japan has a new TCG and it actually looks pretty good. So generated also 1200 million. And basically um, the game came out in this fiscal year. So you had the five star decks come out at the start of April. At the end of April, you also had the first booster set. And then in the end of June, they had the first theme deck as well. And then we have set two coming out, actually just came out here in Japan too. My sister doesn't care, give a care about card games, loves Conan, so it might be tar different target demo too. But the thing is, a lot of TCG players are also playing this game because the art just looks good. And also a lot of like, they put like manga panels on art. And it just like, when you look at it like this, right? It looks good. Like when you just look at the cards, they do look really nice. 
and overall like Takara Tomi just kind of did a pretty good job with it I think and Conan is a very big IP like case closed is a huge IP in Japan so it's kind of like set up for success I almost, almost want to say let's see what Ikechi has to say about it. it is the last TCG that he actually makes a comment on so he says this is the fourth or fifth time that Conan has been made into a card game but it's still very popular and somehow created a 12 billion yen market so Oh, sorry, not 12, 1.2 billion yen, right? Because it's it's 1,200 million. He says that most likely this card game is selling better in stores that do anime goods, like animate, more so than card shops. So you probably don't see it selling at card shops as much as you do see it selling in these general anime shops because there's a lot of female collectors as well. So it's very popular with, I guess, the Conan audience. So he says, I hope this this TCG will also continue to have this steady good sales in the future. And he says there are high rarity like autographed cards. He said if they start including uh, cards signed by voice actors, that would be uh, a crazy, you know, a crazy development, a, a, a big big uh, development for the industry as well that probably would propel this game too that's pretty crazy i had no idea that there's been that many conan card games it's, it's, it's kind of like digimon but then we move on to vanguard so vanguard gets in at 11th with 10 so basically a billion yen right compared to last year's spring at 9.4 we see a little bit of an increase here but overall doing pretty good especially when you consider what came out during this period this year too for vanguard we had the release of set two so of course this was the blangmire set that of course you know was obviously not going to be as hype as the set one of divines but it still included a lot of like chase cards people were still chasing these secret rares you know like blangmire and zorga and of course the liela morta herself too but another big chase for this set was the the bang dream triggers and you know a lot of like the the, the random like sign stuff and whatnot so i think i think that set sold relatively well but i think definitely the biggest seller of this period was festival booster festival booster of course included very you know first it had the appeal of these energy cards it was also pre-sold at the card game festival too which i think generated a fair bit of sales it's a reprint set so a lot of like staples are reprinted in it to begin with but i think for competitive players you know this set was definitely very important because we had these great ones but most importantly the dual nation cards everyone went kind of am on just opening cases to like get their two play sets of each of these and like the double wares too and of course the reprints so i think this probably was the big seller and then the last set that released in this quarter was set three which of course included a lot of really good decks like of course you know we had dayusha coming back luki like venus luki as well but shoujo doji being a tier one deck that was very cheap to build at the time too you know together with of course archite as well and like the secret rares and all the kind of stuff for me of course just having um dayusha back is very exciting but these secret rares actually you know went for a fair bit funnily enough i never see these in stock anymore Part of me kind of regrets not getting an archive, but it is what it is. And also the latter reprint, like the sales for the set, I think probably did quite well. And also in Japan, we had the Vispo collab. That definitely was a big part of this set selling. So Vispo, man, this this definitely was a huge, huge thing. If you don't know what Vispo is, it's, a, it's like a very big VTuber group in Japan. They're not very big in the West, but in Japan, they're really huge. So we had like like a very very big amount of people getting into vanguard or like building this deck in particular i mean ignidius and chat literally is one of them so personally i think it's pretty good like when you think about it vanguard was 11th in last year and it's 11th now but you have to think about the fact that there's three new card games above it and when a card game comes out it always has a buff like when a new card game comes out, it's always going to be at the top, no matter what, because people are getting into it. And it's the next two quarters that show if that first hype lasted or not. And unfortunately, in 14th, we see an example of things maybe, you know, dw dwindling down and same for 12th as well. So honestly, quite proud of Vanguard for making still a billion yen in this period and looking forward to seeing what the next quarter will bring as well. And then in 12th, we have Union Arena, actually a huge decrease, right? 55%, so 12, so basically 1.2 billion yen and now just you know not not even it's like 670 or 67 million basically we take a look at what came out for union arena in this uh period unfortunately both nikkei and haikyuu came out in the previous fiscal year but we had black clover which are people still excited about black clover i'm not sure i feel like if this was like five six years ago it would have been different yu yu hakusho honestly i think definitely yu yu hakusho has its uh, audience for sure Gamera Rebirth. I unfortunately don't even know what this series is. 
Um, Attack on Titan, of course. Seems like it's the like OG first season Attack on Titan. It's not like the the end of Attack on Titan, so it's kind of surprising. And so that's that's basically Attack on Titan was the last of this fiscal quarter. So the entries are seem okay, but I'm assuming if anything sold really well, it was probably Attack on Titan. But even then, Attack on Titan is like the anime is over, the manga is over, like. What is there to get hyped about? But I heard the Attack on Titan deck is good. Like there, there is a good deck in there. So that's that's kind of nice. But then looking at the next quarter too, it's like, what is this? Like Shy? This this is literally called Shy. Undead Unlock. I like the art of this series. I never watched it though. You got like the hundred girlfriends anime. Idol Master, like the yeah, you know, it's like the, the Gakuin. Um, this is like the new Idol Master game that just came out that a lot of people really love. So this like idol master game is like super popular in japan right now so there's a high chance that this will sell very well in the next quarter or i mean when it releases in september and there's also like kaiju number eight kamen rider and arc knights so looks pretty good for the future for union arena but it's kind of crazy when you think that this game is targeting vice and vice released like a, quite a few kind of like whatever sets and it managed to end up in fifth and union arena released a couple whatever sets and it's like a sixth Basically a fifth of Vice's sales, it's pretty insane. After Union Arena, almost the same number is a Battle Spirit. So I genuinely have a feeling that Union Arena is more popular than Battle Spirits, but they actually made about the same amount and they also dropped about the same amount compared to last year's Spring 2. So Battle Spirits I can never really comment on because I don't know what's going on. It's like they released a set here at the beginning of the fiscal year, some sleeves that look cool, a premium set for like a hundred bucks, another premium set for like a hundred bucks, and then another set that kind of like seems it's like a diva booster 10th party like doesn't really tell me too much but seems like they sold all right and then uh we have shadowverse evolve that also dropped off pretty hard compared to last year's spring so spring is shadowverse evolves anniversary season so april specifically and last year the first anniversary was quite hype so 13 you know like 1.3 billion yen was quite good it was the omen set of course very very hyped up stuff and it was also like the paragons of the Colosseum set also very hyped up but this spring what happened you know only six oku 600 million yen so basically when you look at it in April, we had the anniversary set Gods of the Arcana, set 10. Then we had the deluxe starter decks, which were the... Basically, for 4,000 yen, you got two competitive ready decks. So normally you're thinking that's like a dream come true. And then at the end of June, just before the first quarter cuts off, we had the Vanguard collab starter decks and booster set. So when you look at Gods of the Arcana, I mean, they're just going to just spit out the card list at me, but it's basically the, the Arcana deck, right? Some of you might remember this from App Shadowverse, and it's a very popular set, very famous, lots of like cool stuff, lots of anime decks too, right? People love the Shadowverse Flame anime. So you'd think this is a recipe for success. The problem is that in the set before this, they supported a deck that became tier zero, and majority of the stuff in this set could not fight in the same room as the stuff in here. And so basically, you just release a set with a very few meta relevant cards and in a game that's carried by competitive play and not as big of a collector's market, that just can't really, that, that's not gonna be very good, right? You release a starter deck set that contains two competitively ready decks, but you know, they're good, they're really good if it wasn't for a deck called Earthrite existing, right? So it just feels like, if these released before this set would have been fantastic, but a tier zero meta is not really great. And the Vanguard collab set, I, of course, as a Vanguard person, I'm really happy about. I, as a card game industry person, I'm very happy about because it's so cool to see two card games collaborating. But the problem is that it also launched another tier zero meta with Overlord, Kagero, be being basically just, you know, an insane deck that in the, you know, over this weekend we had a Grand Prix in, in Nagoya that uh, out of like 900 players, the top eight was basically like six Kagero Overlords, one Dragoncraft Overlord, and one Natura Sword. So it's like, it's very much again another tier zero meta. So the hype isn't necessarily that great. I'm not sure how this quarter will go. I'm pretty sure this quarter we literally just have... We have set 11, which is the Storm of Reveil set. 
And then we also have the Seaside Memories reprints that will like all like the bikini arts with reprints. So we'll see if this sells well. The pack is like one pack is 800 yen, which is very expensive. So we're going to have to see how things go. But honestly, I think for Shadowverse Evolve, it's also the case that the cases are getting more expensive because they're going to started adding more different types of the high rarity cards in a box. So now the shops that open a bunch of boxes to sell singles, they have to pay more for a case because now in order to make it so you have enough of every rarity per case to do business, they in included more boxes per case, making the cases more expensive. So the shops are kind of paying the state like more for what they were getting before for less cost. So quite a few shops are also um, kind of just taking this chance to bow out from the game and look at some of the future games. I mean, we have Hollow Life TCG coming out in fall as well. And also, yeah, like this, this set doesn't have leader cards in it too. So there's just gonna be a lot of big changes for the game. And I'm curious to see, like, I think these next two quarters will be very important for, for Evolve. You know, I'm just saying this objectively, like, you know, I am an official ambassador for this game and I really want the best for it. I think the game is amazing and I, really hope that you know we're able to bounce back in a big way and i think especially this set should be very popular like natura and machina as themes are super super popular so hoping for the best and i hope this reprint set also does well and they announce some really really nice things but yeah definitely feel a little bit sad you know seeing evolve at 14th and then in 15th barely making it is the digimon card game at 3.8 hundred million so or 380 million sorry 380 million so it is an increase over last year last year was 2.2 this year it's 3.8 in spring in comparison so it's a big increase but of course compared to the other games it's you know it's basically like what a third of vanguard and i guess the releases kind of speak for themselves because secret crisis is not counted towards the fiscal year here it was part of last fiscal year and instead we have of course the starter decks and booster set for digimon liberator which is ex07 which i saw being sold for discounted prices so i'm not sure how well this sold and then bt18 i didn't look at too much because I was, I was really into this set but the two sets after that didn't really catch my attention too much so i'm not sure how well this one sold but i you know i heard from my chat that it was like so so it was an okay set and that basically summarizes it so in terms of what didn't make it into this top 15 because of the new card games coming out you essentially had i'm not sure if wick cross was in the last one but wick cross isn't here zx isn't in here either from the new releases flesh and blood came out in Japan and you'd think because single price sales contribute to these numbers you'd think that it would have gotten into it but Flesh and Blood is not in this ranking, even not even 15th. Yeah, Bill Divide. Bill Divide is out of the race as well. And I'm not sure what else I'm forgetting. Yeah, Rebirth for You. Rebirth for You is also out of the top 15 race as well. So that has been this look at the first fiscal quarter of the card game industry in Japan. I hope you enjoyed this video. We did this, you know, last time looking at the entirety of fiscal year 2023. So I hope that you also enjoyed this look at quarter one. I definitely will continue to do these videos because I personally enjoy translating this kind of stuff and uh, bringing the information to the rest of you guys. I'm personally quite happy. I mean, the game I cover is Vanguard and I'm honestly quite happy at where it's placed. I think that overall, the whole industry being carried by Pokemon is really nice to see that it's still continuing its hype even after all these years. Yu-Gi-Oh! is still holding up well, honestly. I mean, we all started with Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm, I'm, I'm definitely happy seeing it be do this, you know, be doing this well as well. Duel Masters is no surprise. One Piece is no surprise. Vice, like the top five are kind of like been like that all the time. Next quarter, what I'm really looking forward to seeing is how Dragon Ball, Dream Order, Rush Duel, Conan TCG will place because I think those four are the ones that are in like the most volatile positions. Everything else thing is quite stable. I think every other card game is probably going to remain at like similar positions compared to this quarter, but still it's very fun to look at this kind of stuff. So if you like this video, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe and comment down below what you thought about these rankings Did your favorite card game make it in. Don't forget, we have Hololive TCG coming out this fall, which will definitely be a big player. And I believe that Lorcana's Japanese edition also got announced at some point, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going to be another big player in the industry here in Japan and I do think that you know where Dragon Ball is in Japan is kind of where Larkana probably is in the west so it's definitely going to be pretty cool and yeah Rush Duel is probably going to be doing pretty good in uh in the next quarter as well so definitely going to be very exciting stuff but yeah we'll get to reflect on July August and September uh looking at next you know, next quarter so I think September is also the whole life release so 
it's gonna be a big one but with that that's gonna be it for me today thank you so much for watching and i'll see you guys next time bye bye